All right, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the Singapore International Water Week webinar series. My name is uh, Ryan Yun, and I'm the Managing Director of SIWW. Thank you for taking time today to join us for this webinar. Today is a special day for SIWW. Earlier in the year, due to COVID-19, we took the difficult decision to reschedule SIWW to next June. Had that not been the case, we will actually be celebrating the opening of the show today on the 6th of July. So since all of you are unable to come to Singapore today, we thought, why don't we bring our content to you instead? That is why we decided to launch our SIWW webinar series. Today marks the start of a year-long series of webinars that we will be curating with our partners. They will focus on key thematic areas of importance to the international water community. This afternoon, we are delighted to be co-organizing this webinar with Arcadis on the important topic of urban coastal resilience. I hope you will have an enjoyable time learning from the panel of experts that we have lined up for you. I'd like to remind participants that recording of this webinar is strictly forbidden. We will be making a recorded version of this webinar available on our social media channels later on. So before we, in, before we open the webinar and, and invite the speakers to give their presentation, uh, I will first like to do a small interactive activity with everyone who is tuning in today. Through this activity, we would like to find out from every one of you your views of this topic, urban social, urban coastal resilience. So you will see on the screen in front of you, on the right-hand side, a URL. So I would invite everybody to turn on your web browser and to click in the URL siww.sparkup.live. And once you are in the web page, enter the event code LVGTV and join in as a new visitor. So please uh, take out your mobile phones or your mobile devices, open up your browser, click siww.sparkup.live as a URL, enter the event code LVGTV and join as a new visitor. So once you have done this, you will be on this screen here, as you could see on my handphone in front of you, you will end on this screen, right? So let's take about, I'll give maybe about 30 seconds for everybody to log in before we will start the first activity. So once again, if you have your handphone with you, uh, open your web browser and click siww.parkup.live and enter the code LVGTV. All right. So once, if everybody is in, I would like to launch the first activity. I would like to launch the first activity, the word cloud. I would like to launch the first activity, the word cloud. And in, in the word activity, you would see here, there are a few options for you. We would like to ask you what comes to your mind when we talk about urban coastal resilience. There are a few options that are mentioned here. If, you, if, you, if there's something that you like, you see options here that it resonates with you, please click against the, the word or the phrase that you like. Otherwise, if there are other words that you would like to include, please add in the word. For phrases, because you can only have a space for a word, uh, add in the phrase with a dash in between. So let's take about a minute to do that. And as the words are being entered, and uh, as people more and more people like the word, you could see that the, the text becomes bigger. And uh, that shows that uh, it is ranked highest in terms of the audience participation. So by all means, click as many as you like, any of the words that resonates with you. Let's take about uh, 30 minutes, 30 seconds to do that. So 
So you would see that some of the words that are coming up uh, that, <clears throat> that people talk about when they talk about urban coastal resilience would be like climate change, sea level rise, flood protection. There's also words like vulnerability, awareness, community, natural hazards that comes to mind. All right, so let's take the last five seconds before we close out this activity. Five, four, three, two, one. Thank you very much. We will close off the activity. And you will see right now in front of you, the screen showing all the words that uh, every one of you has participated and contributed towards uh, this particular word cloud, which is what comes to your mind when we talk about urban coastal resilience. Later on, as part of the presentation and panel discussion, some of these keywords will come up and, uh, and, we, and the panelists will talk a bit about this later on. Let's go on to the second activity. The second activity has just come up in your screen. Please click join. And this is a poll. In this poll, we're asking you, what are the critical enablers to successfully enhance urban coastal resilience? Please select up to three, any of the three. I think there's about seven options here. Select any three that you think are critical enablers. All right, wow, wow, okay, great. Thanks for all the response. Let's uh, take another 10 seconds for everybody to click. Uh, you can see right now in front of you, integrated urban planning and land use has garnered the most votes, followed by readiness to adopt technology and innovation and rank third is stakeholder involvement and engagement. All right. So uh, let's give ourselves five more seconds. Five, four, three, two, one. Okay, thank you. Let's close off the vote. And uh, just to summarize again, integrated urban planning and management and land use seems to be the one with the highest number of votes, followed by readiness to adopt technology and innovation. And lastly, stakeholder involvement and engagement. Again, we will be revisiting some of these enablers as part of the panel discussion. Final activity, the last poll. Please click join. And this poll, we're asking, in your opinion, what are the most pressing issues facing the water, wastewater, and stormwater industry? Please click any three that you think, in your opinion, are the pressing issues facing our industry today. All right, so let us uh, take 10 more seconds. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Okay, let's close the poll. Thank you so much. Uh, in terms of ranking, aging infrastructures comes up tops with the most number of votes, followed by integrated water planning. And finally, systems resilience against external shocks. So thank you so much for your participation. I hope that gives you an interactive opportunity to kind of share your thoughts with us. And um, let's move on to the webinar itself. So this afternoon, we are extremely delighted and honored that the webinar is supported by the Kingdom Embassy of the Kingdom of the Netherlands. And so to kick off the webinar, it is my pleasure to invite the Netherlands Ambassador to Singapore and Brunei, Her Excellency Margaret Vono, to deliver her welcome address. Ambassador, please. Um, hello, can you see me all? Yes, Ambassador, we can yes, see you. That's me Thanks now. for joining us. I had some problem uh, going in because security in the Netherlands is really high. But uh, thank you so much for having me here. It's really great that although there's no fiscal Singapore International Water Week, that we are here together talking about urban resilience. And uh, 
um, water management resilience. I myself was born under the sea level, as are a lot of Dutch people, because about 25% of our country or even more is uh, beneath sea level. And I thought that was just normal or the new normal. But now I know in uh, Singapore that that's the country above sea level, although it's only five meters above sea level. So I guess that both here in Singapore and we in the Netherlands, that we can learn for each other, from each other and that we have to be very resilient with climate change and with the rising sea levels. And I'm very proud that we have so many qualified Dutch here in Singapore from Arcades, Boscales, Deltares, um, Wittevene and Bos, um, you name them, Royal Haskoning. We have a lot of engineers who work together with our counterparts in Singapore all over the world to sort of find solutions that are sustainable for the short run and the longer run. And that's why I'm so happy that we have this uh, webinar together and I'm really looking forward to learning more from all the speakers. So Ryan, this is it from me. Uh, I'm curious, as probably most of the viewers are, to learn more from the experts. For me, I can tell you it's safe cycling beneath sea level in the Netherlands. Please come over one time and see it for yourself. And I'm looking forward to learning more about the urban coastal resilience in the Singapore and in the Netherlands. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you, Ambassador, for taking the time off your busy schedule to join us. And uh, again, thank you for your support uh, for the webinar and for Singapore and the Singapore International Waterway in general. Thank you again. All right, so let's uh, start off uh, by inviting our first speaker for this today's webinar. He is uh, Pete Dirk. Pete is Arcadis' global leader for resilience and water management. He has uh, over 35 years of experience in water management, urban resilience, flood protection, waterfront development, and climate change adaptation. He was a platform partner with 100 Resilient Cities and has worked with Chief Resilient Officers of Cities around the globe. Pete will be sharing the innovations in urban coastal climate resilience from an economic and community perspective. Pete, over to you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Ryan, for your kind introduction. Um, this is my first slide, um, talking about urban coastal resilience economic and community perspective, I think this picture gives a great example of how our citizens in Rotterdam deal with that. Um, I will in my presentation touch upon a number of critical elements of uh, how to address economic and the commercial and uh, community perspective. So let's go to the next slide, please. What scored highest in your poll and your first question was an integrated urban planning. And that is absolutely true. That was also the first uh, experience I had myself uh, right after Katrina in New Orleans that uh, was hit in 2005. In 2007, we started the so-called Dutch Dialogues. That was based on the concern, as the bottom left picture shows you, of a too much civil engineered flood protection system with very little room for economy, community, and also the ecosystem. And we started these integrated, multidisciplinary, multi-scale types of design sessions. So design was key and the multidisciplinarity was key. But the community aspect was still rather limited. The next slide shows you how we went on in New York, right after Hurricane Sandy hit New York in 2012, um, where President Obama um, started the so-called rebuild by design competition. This was a design competition. It was led by a famous Dutch guy in the middle. You see that small picture standing him in the water, Henk Ovink, our Dutch uh, water envoy. He was leading this process, again integrated planning and design, but now also with a very strong community aspect of community leadership involved. And not just by telling the community what we have designed with them, but to have that community actively involved in the design itself. So really taking part in that design. Next slide, please. So 
So here are two examples, just one example of how that worked out. The most famous picture of all, I think, of the people by design competition, the uh, tip of uh, southern Manhattan with the so-called Big Hue. And the next slide shows you how the Big Hue is drawn as a meandering green line all around the tip of southern Manhattan. This became like almost an iconic uh, picture for the Rebuild by Design competition in, in New York. And uh, we are currently still working on many follow-up projects and we'll talk about that uh, later as well. Next slide, we move over to another element and that's a bit the element also of economy, which did not score very high in, in your poll. I was a bit surprised about that because economy plays an important role when we talk about resilience. I think we learned that even more than ever during this COVID-19 crisis, the enormous impact that there can be on the economy. Now here you see how the Dutch in a creative way dealt with sea level rise and with the new dikes that had to be built. They decided to combine those dikes with different other infrastructural elements like a dune to make it more natural looking, with a boulevard to have a tourist recreation facility, but also even as you see in the middle one with a parking garage. And the next slide shows you a bit more detail on that one the parking garage in Katwijk, as it is called. Very creative, a dike underneath a dune, creating a beautiful ecosystem reserve, nice area for tourists to walk around. But it also has a parking garage. And this parking garage means that there are additional revenues to be earned by a private or by a public party. It also means that tourist flows on the hot sunny days in this tourist resort will go much smoothly and the boulevard on top will remain for the pedestrians. So this town of Katwijk not only got a perfect flood protection, it also got a boost for its economy and also the community is absolutely more than happy and even traffic is better arranged. So a perfect combination here of those different elements. And the next slide, moving over from Katwijk, gives us even a better example in the middle of Rotterdam. This example, this was not an Arcadis project, but I'm still very proud of it. I was a professor at the Rotterdam University for eight years when this project was developed. Here you see the most multifunctional dike, I believe, that we currently have on Earth. It has a park on top, it has a pedestrian zone, as you can see. It even has a children's playground with water. I think only the Dutch can do that to have a water playground on top of a dike. It also has a restaurant and even more, it has a shopping mall integrated in it. The right hand side wall that you see is a shopping mall and there's a parking garage underneath it. So this multifunctional structure is not dividing the left and the right hand neighborhood of it. It's a connector between those neighborhoods, connecting communities and also integrated economic functionality into its coastal resilience. A truly example of multifunctionality, I would say. And next slide touches upon another element of uh, um, this uh, integrating. We don't need to integrate only and develop new waterfronts and new coastal protection areas. Sometimes we can in our ports uh, areas also use existing waterfronts and docks and former port areas that maybe need a kind of a retrofitting. So this is my, my university where I was uh, in the office for eight years. The RDM campus, this used to be a dry dock. And as many visitors have seen, this dry dock, which was abandoned and it was deserted, it was polluted, was completely revitalized by a, a public-private partnership of the city of Rotterdam, the Rotterdam University, the port of Rotterdam, and several private investors and turned into this new research center for students but also for young startups focusing on resilience and on the sustainability perfect example of retrofitting but at the same time you see behind those big office buildings also a neighborhood that neighborhood was completely disconnected from the city and from the waterfront and this new development made it possible to reconnect the community to the waterfront offer them even public transport because there is water transportation now uh, going to the university campus here and even also offering new jobs and new opportunities for that community. So this is a perfect example also of integrating different functionalities into 
developing a new waterfront. And then that all led next slide to this absolutely state-of-the-art project um, that we're currently on in uh, New York. Next slide, please. There we are. New York, this is, let's say, the most challenging waterfront that, that I've seen so far. Oh, one slide back, please. Can you go one slide back? Yeah, that's it. New York, this is the Wall, uh, the Wall Street waterfront, financial district uh, in New York. This is really a challenge. Everybody who has been there in between the, the Brooklyn and the Manhattan Bridge knows how challenging this environment is with its infrastructure, buildings, everything comes together here. And here we want to combine flood protection with urban development in such a way that it makes this a better place to live, to work and to visit. With a very green waterfront with very complicated financial arrangements uh, that will be required. And with also very strong community involvement. The community leadership is very strong in this area. So they're very keen to participate. And you see how we uh, also reach out to them with modern technology like virtual reality and other tools. This project currently is on hold because of the COVID-19 crisis that also hit New York, of course. Um, but we're sure somewhere later this year or early next year, we will continue and work on this very challenging waterfall. And I think we all can learn a lot from this project, also here in uh, Singapore. So it will be very interesting to follow how this project is going. Next slide, please. Um, bankable resilience tool. This is an important topic. Um, looking at all those previous steps, combining economy and community. Big question is, of course, who's going to pay for all of that? And what are the costs and what are the benefits? And very often uh, we experience that people do not fully understand the true benefits of coastal resilience. There's a lot of benefits. And we developed this tool that we call BART, the Bankable Resilience Tool, to better make clear what those benefits are. They can include not only the avoidance of damage, which is a, a logic result of the flood protection, but it also includes, for instance, the increase of real estate values, land values, social benefits like health and safety benefits, ecosystems benefits like uh, improving the urban climate. And all those benefits in this tool are shared and then divided over the different stakeholders. So the really interesting question is not only what are the benefits, but also who is benefiting. So this tool opens up the opportunity to have a dialogue with all participants discussing costs and benefits of urban resilience and we all hope that that will lead to more investments more private investors interesting in working with uh, coastal urban resilience and with urban climate resilience uh, in general so next slide and this is basically already my uh, my story just wrapping it all up for you in the final slides some concluding remarks i think it was already said by me integrated approach that also scored high in your own poll this interactive involvement of stakeholders, not just informing the stakeholders, but truly let them work in your design process. It's a challenge, it's not easy, but it really uh, creates much more public support than when you just present your plan. Multifunctionality can help you to make better use of your very precious urban space and create uh, revenue streams. This mixed use on the waterfront, retrofitting, creating access uh, for communities, but maybe also simply creating jobs for communities. And that all helps to increase the urban quality of life. And last but not least, if we want to deal with resilience, if we want to be more resilient, we will have to convince people that resilience pays off, that it is a good investment, and that there are a lot of benefits. Sometimes you don't see them immediately, but when you start thinking about it and calculating on it, then you will see the true benefit of resilience and that will help to make it a better business case and that was my story thank you very much the last slide just uh, thanks you and uh, all for listening to me thank you ryan back to you thanks pete thanks for sharing the uh, innovations that uh, about from the economic and community perspective let's move on to our next speaker our next speaker is uh, laura von hogan peters and she is the Associate Director of the Singapore Operations in Daltares. 
Laura is an earth scientist with experience in both applied geology and coastal systems. In the Netherlands, she has been extensively involved in the research for the support of the National Coastal Maintenance Policy. In Singapore, she has been involved in the development and application of urban resilience solutions and strategies in Southeast Asia cities. So Laura will be talking about innovations in urban coastal climate resilience from two other perspectives, from the technical perspective, as well as the ecosystems perspective. Laura, over to you. Thank you, Ryan. Can you see me? Um, I, have, I have been asked to shed some light, as Ryan mentioned, on a technical and ecosystem perspective of urban coastal climate resilience. As mentioned, I'm based here in Singapore for Deltares and also part of the Knowledge Alliance and US Deltares. And coming from that perspective, I will use some Singapore examples to highlight, I think, lessons or general things that apply also to other coastal cities around the world. Next slide, please. Just a brief recap to start with. What is resilience? Resilience is the capability of a society to cope with shocks and stresses. Now, shocks and stresses can be climate change, sea level rise, but also, for example, the effects of a pandemic like COVID-19. And why then an ecosystem perspective? Well, if you look at challenges that cities are facing, you should not only look at social and economic challenges, but also to physical challenges that cities are facing, like, for example, at the bottom, floods, droughts, water quality issues, but also urban heat island effect. Next one, please. Next. So this movie from satellite imagery shows that in Singapore, quite a lot has changed already over time. And Singapore has adapted to it. It has adapted by increasing its land surface area, and it has adapted to its increased urban urbanization or urbanized areas. Next one, please. So what's the challenge that Singapore, but also other cities are facing? Well, when it comes to climate change, you really have to look into all the aspects. You have to look into climate change drivers, like emission of um, the CO2, CO2 apologies. Uh, you can mitigate those emissions and that will buy you time to take measures for all the changes that are going to happen. You have to look into climate change impact. The accelerated sea level rise as a result of the accelerated melting of the Arctic ice sheet should be taken into account. Uh, also because measures that you take now might be sooner out of business because the sea level is rising faster. When looking into climate change adaptation, we should not look at one aspect of climate change in the city. For example, when you talk about floods, we should not look in the coastal area just at the effects of sea level rise or the effects of increased rainfall events, but we should really look at the combined effect of both. When you look into saltwater intrusion, it has an effect on infrastructure that's already in the coastal areas when it comes to corrosion. But it also has an effect on the availability of fresh water as a resource. Next one, please. So what is the key challenge then, if I show you this all? Well, I think cities are very complex systems. And on top of that, Climate change is also very complex because it comes in many forms, magnitudes, and rates. And we can sum that up quite nicely as the key challenge being deep uncertainty, especially if we don't know how the system works, this deep uncertainty becomes bigger. Next one, please. So how do we deal with this challenge? How do we deal with the deep uncertainty? Well, I think first of all, the first step should be to really start to understand the system, start, start to understand the cities and the interactions that take place there. But also look at all the items and aspects within climate change and how that affects your city. And we should do that in an integrated multidisciplinary approach because in cities, in coastal areas, a lot of aspects are coming together. We should also make robust plans that can be adapted over time 
because right now we're not sure what is going to change when. But we should not stop with making the first step. We should start now and see how we can combine all the no regrets or hardly regret measures that we can take already. We should also encourage, just like Pete mentioned, multifunctional measures and solutions. So not looking at one aspect again, but combining them. And most importantly, from my perspective, would to be to not do it alone. Climate change drivers are something that involves the whole world. Climate change impact, there are already a lot of institutions looking into that. So let's learn from each other. And last but not all, and I think Singapore has done a great job there already, go visit, talk to each other and discuss what kind of measures and solutions work or don't work, like how the Dutch are working and living with water. Next one, please. So where do we start? Where do we start in understanding the fiscal system? I think data, models, software could provide an important service there. And I deliberately put it as service because I think data models and software should be tools to use and not a goal by itself. These three items can help us to determine relationship, challenges, risks and opportunities in the fiscal system. They can help to identify vulnerable, sensitive or critical factors and resilience indicators. And on the short term, data models and software can help to execute operational management and early warning. So in case that something does go wrong, we know it as soon as possible. Next one, please. We should also use the latest development. I think one strong item there are global data sets and tools because they can really help to understand the system, especially in countries where there's not much information available or as a starting point to figure out where more information is needed. Next one, please. And when it comes to taking measures or uh, implementing solutions, we should adapt to the new normal. In this case, the new normal would be soft solutions if possible and hard engineering measures only if must. And secondly, nature-based solutions as a value add to infrastructure developments. These nature-based solutions are not something new, but it's merely a mind shift uh, towards the future. Next one, please. Because nature-based blue-green solutions or blue-green-gray solutions, as they are sometimes measured, mentioned, are more than just individual measures. Just like Pete showed in the slides, these are really spatial, uh, correctly planned spatial interventions that by using water and vegetation, but sometimes also innovative building materials, can achieve a sustainable, livable, and resilient urban environment. At the same time, by designing solutions that are a beneficiary for multiple stakeholders, we can also come up with more cost-effective solutions, which is also nice in times when uh, financial resources are getting lower. Next one, please. I get often I get a question, it's really nice those nature-based solutions, but where do we start? How do we do that? And I want to show you two examples of nature-based solutions, but I think the world is completely open in this case. So a lot of more possibilities are there. These examples are taken from the EcoShape um, Foundation. This is a collaboration uh, between engineering companies, research institutes, government and NGOs to come up with ways, uh, pilots, but also real life examples for nature-based solutions. So as an example, if you want to counteract the effect of high sea levels and waves, you can do that, for example, by using vegetation. A lot of people are skeptical about that. That's not possible. We tried that. That's way too complicated. We can, can, cannot put a formula on that. Well, what we did with EcoShape is that we put a couple of willows in a one-on-one -on -one scale flume and tested it. See what is actually happening. How much is this wave height going now? And we are planning in the near future 
to also do the same test with mangroves to see how much effect uh, wood of, will, of mangroves can bring down the wave setup. Another example that can be implemented is expanding the foreland in the coastal area. By expanding the area, by expanding the coastal area, you can predict, protect existing structures. That makes it also very cost effective, which is also nice. And also you can use unwanted sediments for that, like uh, soft sediments or mud, which is often discarded as busy being not useful. If you create such a foreland and expand it, you can also generate the, the good and unique environment for vegetation to grow on its own. And when it's green, usually your stakeholders and your people living near the coast also like it very much. Next one, please. So summarizing my message for uh, today's brief introduction would be not to wait for disaster to happen. I know all around the world that government and resources are tied up in handling the COVID pandemic. But we should not wait for climate change to happen, but we should start working on it now. We should acknowledge its, its uncertainties and its complexity and really start connecting the short and long term plans by implementing what can be done now with no regrets and adjusting along the way. Next one, please. So with that message, I would like to thank you for your attention and give the floor back to Ryan. Thank you, Laura. And uh, thanks again, Pete, as well, for uh, sharing the presentation and framing the issue. I think both uh, Pete and Laura made uh, very interesting points, especially in terms of some of the critical enablers that will help us to build urban coastal resilience. I will re re repeat some of these points that they made in terms of uh, urban planning, systems thinking, nature-based solutions, stakeholder engagement, as well as a multidisciplinary integration. And interestingly enough, uh, during the early exercise where all participants uh, took part, some of these uh, critical enablers also featured quite strongly as well as part of the survey. So it will be now interesting to hear how our panel, panel would think from the uh, practitioner's uh, point of view. So moderating the panel this afternoon is uh, Tim Riesbridger. Tim is the head of Arcadis Singapore, and he's responsible for delivering climate change solutions in Southeast Asia with a particular interest in city resilience and environmental sustainability. Joining us on the panel this afternoon is Rulof Kruse. Rulof is the CEO of Waternet, the public water cycle organization of the Amsterdam region. Waternet is responsible for drinking water, wastewater, groundwater, surface water, and safety behind the dikes. Alongside him is Hazel Ku. Hazel is the Director of Coastal Protection Department in PUB, Singapore's National Water Agency. She leads the agency's efforts to safeguard Singapore from the threats of coastal flooding. And finally, the last person on the panel is Edgar Westerhoff. Edgar is Arcadis's Director for Flood Risk and Resiliency for North America, and he leads the Arcadis team in the International Rebuild by Design competition, which Pete spoke about earlier. And uh, she also led the team in winning the Big U plan for the protection of lower Manhattan. And just a special mention and thank you to Edgar as well for waking up early in the morning. I believe it's four o'clock in the morning in New York time. And he has kindly taken the time to join us for this uh, panel discussion. So before I hand it over to Tim, uh, we will be opening up the panel for Q&A as well by our participants. Again, we'll be using the Spark Up app. So under the menu, there is an option called Q&A session. You can lodge your questions via the app, or you can view other questions that have been posted and vote on the question that you would like to see answered. So with that, over to you, Tim. Thank you very much, Ryan, and hello, everyone, and uh, hello and welcome to our panelists. Um, so yes, as Ryan has just mentioned, please do ask your questions, and we'll try to pick up as many of those as we go through the panel discussion uh, this afternoon. But to kick this off, um, I'd like to know a little bit more about the respective cities' coastal management plans so far and in the future and how, how this will be developing to make our cities more resilient. So I think I'll start with Amsterdam. So, Rulof, uh, I understand there is a rainproof project in Amsterdam and uh, would be very interested if you could explain some more about it, its uh, benefits and challenges and some of the successes that you are, are already seeing. 
Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Tim. Uh, normally, I would be in Singapore. I visited all Singapore Water Weeks uh, for the last uh, decade, but it's a very good alternative to see you in this way. Yes, we had the Amsterdam Rainproof uh, Program. It started in uh, 2013, and it started uh, really by a wake-up call because uh, one of the cities uh, north of uh, Holland in Denmark, Copenhagen, was hit by severe rain and it caused 1 billion euros of damage. So we wondered ourselves uh, if the same uh, heavy rain would hit Amsterdam, what would happen? And we could model that. And we, could, we, uh, we were sure we had the same kind of damage because our sewer system can, ob uh, can absorb about 20 millimeter of rain uh, in one hour. And we had our own uh, experience one year later with 100 millimeter of rain in one hour. So the underground system was flooded and we had uh, houses which were flooded. So we had some severe uh, problems. And then we started uh, Amsterdam Rainproof uh, because we were sure that it was uh, all about awareness. Unless people live uh, five to seven meters below sea level, people are not aware of that in the Netherlands. They're very well protected. Uh, so um, we should, uh, mm. every, we needed everybody. We need green roofs. We need more open uh, space in public area and in private area. So we started uh, this campaign showing what uh, what would happen with uh, severe rain. But we also included a drought because the last two summers were, were really dry in the Netherlands. The groundwater level is very important in Amsterdam because the city is constructed on wooden piles. And if we are not very uh, sophisticated looking at that groundwater level, uh, it can cause a lot of economic uh, damage. So seven years later, uh, the awareness is uh, really uh, improved. And, and now uh, I can say that uh, a rain of 60 millimeters an hour doesn't cause uh, any trouble anymore. But of course, we have to go on. Thank you. Thank you, Virov. Um, so uh, moving over to New York now. So Edgar, um, could you expand perhaps a little bit around New York's efforts uh, post Hurricane Sandy? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Tim. Uh, thank you for having me uh, in, this, in this conference. Yeah, of course. I mean, Sandy was a tremendous wake-up call for uh, New York City, not just New York, the entire Sandy affected region, New Jersey, Connecticut, all along uh, the Northeast Coast. You know, we saw this massive, massive devastation. I was the new kid on the block uh, in New York. So, of course, being Dutch, I took my bike and uh, I explored Manhattan. I live uh, the next day to see how well first of course how ill prepared the city was but also to see how quickly uh, the city was yeah, taking action and was starting to understand what actually happened uh, to them uh, a strong response by mayor uh, bloomberg back in the days 2012 um, a strong response by you know starting a tremendous planning exercise a planning exercise to well basically take a step back you know, what does new york uh, what is driving New York as a city? What are the critical components? So understanding risk was uh, yeah, a key a part of that. Um, extensive modeling happened, not just you know the modeling uh, of the, the many storms uh, that could happen in the future, but also trying to understand sea level rise and the various yeah, uh, future scenarios, uh, overlaying that risk to the existing landscape. To, yeah, to understand what vulnerability means, vulnerability to uh, the many city assets that we have, the assets that uh, keep New York City going. And many of those assets were impacted uh, during Sandy, power supply, uh, uh, telecommunication, internet services, uh, the subway uh, was devastated. So a big effort to, uh, to recover. And we are now eight years post uh, Sandy uh, and the city has taken on also, uh, many planning uh, works, planning studies uh, for large stretches of our 540 miles uh, of coastline. Of course, not all the coastlines have been studied, but many uh, have, and we're also starting to see uh, works take shape. So the shuffle will go in the ground soon, and that is also uh, very much needed. Thank you, Edgar. Um, so Hazel, while Singapore is developing its resilience plans, uh, what are some of the lessons that you think Singapore could learn from these other cities? 
Yeah, so thanks team. Uh, our journey started some years back when global projections on sea level rise was made known. Yeah, so for us, we recognize that it is an existential issue. We have lives to protect, livelihoods to preserve, and a nation to defend. And this is what PUB is charged with just recently since April this year. PUB actually took on the role as the National Coastal Protection Agency to coordinate and drive these coastal protection initiatives at the national level. And Singapore has always taken a systems approach yeah, towards water management. And this is something that we will do likewise for coastal protection. This entails ensuring that policies across governments are aligned and forward-looking and that development plans and strategies are integrated. Inter implementation will be based on sound scientific and engineering practices. And we will also look into forecasting real-time operations and emergency response right from the start. You see, throughout all this, we have also learned from other countries that we need to forge synergistic partnerships and to engage our stakeholders systematically. So we do not, the good thing is that Singapore do not need to learn the hard way. We have field experts and forerunners in other coastal cities and low-lying countries to learn from, like New York City and the Netherlands. We will scan the horizon in search of sound approaches, good methods that fit our local context and adapt these solutions that can be applied effectively here. We will also continue to be open to new ideas and adapt them for our use where it's feasible. So I think we talked about, I think uh, Laura talked about, uh, you know, uh, data, about software and everything to advise us. I think it makes sense that if climate change is something that is going to persist, we will start by building a national model to inform us on this challenge that we face. And we want to adopt a risk-based approach to derive optimal level of protection. And this model will come handy to help us to assess the combined risk, not only from the coastal side, but also from the inland uh, rainfall storms. Yeah. And um, coastal protection is basically a long-term undertaking and it will require substantial capital outlay. So I think it is very important that we do this progressively. And for Singapore, we will study segments of our coastlines which are most vulnerable. So next year, we will commence engineering studies along the southeastern coast as well as Jurong Island. We will study the risk more carefully. Yeah, and um, we want to consider threats for both coastal and inland flooding and develop protection strategies. And at the same time, explore multifunctional um, solutions like what um, New York City and the Netherlands have done and even nature-based solutions that can enhance our built environment and create value in the process. However, you know, while POV will drive and coordinate overall coastal protection efforts, we also recognize that we cannot do this alone. Besides working closely across government agencies in the years to come, we will definitely need a larger pool of urban planners, engineers, consultants, contractors, scientists, and so on, you know, providing us with solutions and ideas to this complex and yet exciting endeavor. And therefore, it is important that we start right now to build our required capabilities surrounding coastal protection to support this mission. Great, thanks, Hazel. Um, so we're going to go to the, uh, the poll that we did earlier to look at um, the three top areas that came out of the poll. And obviously number one of those was the integrated urban planning and land use. So um, I'd like to just pass that one over to you, Edgar. Um, maybe you can uh, discuss a little bit more about the, this critical enabler and how it enhanced the uh, urban and coastal resilience. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, and maybe to throw out a couple of uh, numbers, you know, 8 million people in the New York City metro area, 540 miles uh, of coastline, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, Manhattan uh, has uh, well over 1.5 million people at 85 square kilometers. So that gives an idea of the density, uh, the urban density that we are talking about. And uh, urban density without flood protection, you know, we are very well uh, familiar with the strategies that the, the Netherlands have adopted. If you are uh, walking around the waterfront edge in Manhattan or in other places, other boroughs, um, you don't see those, those measures implemented. So there will be yeah, a, a massive operation needed to adjust the existing waterfront uh, edge to bring in elevation. So 
you know, land use as we, as we know it with its existing uh, functionality uh, requires a big retrofit uh, operation. A retrofit operation to bring in several meters of elevation. Um, we'll uh, combine that with programming, so really to, uh, to make a connection with the existing uh, community. But that's a, that's a complicated one. So it's not just about you know, flood protection, it's about community benefits. Um, and that urban planning effort, that is something yeah, we, we deal with at a daily, uh, a daily basis, trying to integrate uh, the many needs, trying to connect stakeholder interest, mm -hmm. community interest, and bring it uh, together in that small strip of uh, land that we have in between yeah, the built environment uh, and the water. At the same time, you know, trying to bring in ecological benefits. Uh, if you look at Manhattan, there's a hard edge a bulkhead, a steel bulkhead. Well, over time, we try to make that more uh, flexible, <coughs> more, bring more ecological value uh, to it. Thank you. Um, Hazel, uh, one of the other highly scored questions was um, around adoption of technology and innovation and how ready we are to do that in resilience. Maybe you could talk a little bit about that. Yeah. So, Given the uncertainties in climate projections, I think there's definitely scope to make use of big data on weather, climate, and coastal hydrodynamics so that um, for our advanced modeling, simulation, and prediction, this will help to improve our understanding as we move you know, uh, towards a risk-based approach. And it is important to ensure that our planning, design, implementation, and even operations are data-driven and based on the best available science. Singapore has also put in place the National Sea Level Research Program to better understand future sea level rise and coastal conditions around Singapore. PUB and Met Services Singapore are also collaborating closely to improve the processing of radar data to refine real-time forecasting of rainfall to start with and moving towards storm surges. So we will continue to capitalize and invest in machine learning, artificial intelligence and video analytics and in this way, we can be well positioned, you know, in time to come to adopt and apply innovative technologies that could provide this scientific data that optimize our planning as well as operations. We envisage that in years to come, the national model that we are de developing will actually be equipped with such features for intelligent application. Thank you very much. Um, we're, we're a bit short of time, so we've agreed that we're going to extend this panel discussion by another the 10 minutes if that's all right with all of you. Um, so uh, Rulof, I'd like to just go on to the third of the um, on the poll was that the stakeholder involvement and engagement. Can you just maybe talk a little bit about some of the key areas that you feel is important? Yes, I, uh, I really agree with that. Uh, without uh, stakeholder investment, uh, I think it's, uh, it's rather impossible uh, to create uh, a vulnerable uh, system. Uh, in the Netherlands, uh, we want to uh, uh, adapt and anticipate. Uh, so we have uh, a Delta law, a Delta commissioner, and a Delta fund uh, on the national level, but also on the city level. Uh, we're taking care of it. Uh, I can uh, mention the harbor area, the Amsterdam harbor area. It's below sea level, so we have a free layer of uh, defense, first dikes. Uh, have them, uh, we have them keep. We, should keep them in good condition, but after the dikes, we also want to protect the uh, vital infrastructure. And there you need uh, stakeholder investment because uh, there are a lot of uh, functions in this harbor area which affect the total country. So, uh, for instance, uh, the wastewater treatment plant of the whole area is in the harbor area, but also the fuel for Schiphol Airport is transported from that area. So uh, all these different stakeholders uh, should come together and see how they can make also these uh, vital infrastructure behind the dikes more vulnerable. And uh, so we need uh, to show what the effects are. And when you show people what the effects are, they really become interested. That's the experience we have. Great. Thank you. And um, so we're going to go to the, to the questions that are coming in now on the system. Um, and the first one really is for you again, Rudolf, actually. Um, what are some of the traditional uh, values that the Dutch can share with the world in the context of coastal protection? Well, of course, uh, we have uh, centuries of uh, experience uh, 
in the early middle ages, uh, the Netherlands it's laying in the delta of, of two big rivers. Uh, we were already fighting uh, flood, uh, fighting to the sea. And I think a uh, very important thing is to adapt and never wait uh, for a disaster, but adapt. And uh, we have uh, make uh, risk analysis. So at this time, the protection rate in Amsterdam is one in 10,000 years. So one in 10,000 years, there will be a serious uh, flooding uh, which uh, hit the city. Uh, but due, due to uh, sea level rise, uh, this, is, uh, this risk is, uh, is going up. So in uh, 50 years, it will be in one in 2,000 years or one in 3,000 years. So uh, adapt to that huh? and, uh, and look at it and uh, involve all the customers and all the stakeholders. In the Netherlands, we have a system of water boards, uh, democratic elected uh, water boards, which are specially responsible for this uh, flood protection. And they have their own tax system. So I think people can learn from that. Thank you, Rudolf. Yes, good points, well made. Um, so, Edgar, um, so there's, there's a question that's come through around more traditional flood management and are there lessons that we can uh, take from history, uh, you know, more so than modern technology? And the question is, do we ignore wisdom from the past? So maybe a little bit about where we're building on the, uh, the lessons of the past. As well. Yeah, I mean, lessons from the, the past. I, I would, you know, bring up the uh, the challenge that many uh, built uh, uh, cities in in the U.S. bring, which is my perspective. Um, aging infrastructure was mentioned as, as a challenge. So, what is your starting point when you need to bring in uh, flood protection uh, solutions? Uh, retrofitting at the same time, you know, we need innovation through uh, finance. Uh, Pete uh, touched on that, uh, and I think we have a tremendous opportunity. Um, also, looking a little bit at uh, Laura's slide with the waves uh, that I like a lot, you know, the COVID, uh, but at the same time, uh, the, 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 the depression that we may uh, have ahead of us. So, bringing in private sector money to uh, to make flood protection works possible uh, is is key, is front and center, and that is one of the. Yeah, the, the key themes uh, that is being implemented uh, in our planning work uh, throughout the states, not just New York City, but many cities like Miami, like Boston, Toronto, uh, they all uh, are challenging themselves with, you know, how can we tap into private uh, sector money? Thank you, Edgar. Uh, hey, so a couple of questions that have come through. One is around funding and how, how, do, how do we, fund, how do cities fund uh, some of these resilient works are going to be required. And also there's a question being raised about whether Singapore can be sort of a regional center of excellence, uh, setting, setting the example, if you like, of being a, a city that's been able to deal and be, become more resilient ahead of some of the perhaps other cities in the region. Okay, uh, on the funding, I think we recognize that coastal protection requires significant financial investment, but fortunately it will be required over the next 50 to 100 years. So if we were to start now, actually this long runway will actually allow the government to save across terms of government and also to come up with strategies to actually uh, um, finance these um, measures. So um, our responsibility is then to plan carefully and to ensure that our plans are sustainable. And you, many of us would have heard, you know, of the 100 billion yeah, that was mentioned by the Prime Minister of Singapore at the National Day Rally last year. And that was really a preliminary estimate of the total cost that could be required to implement coastal adaptation measures. Mm. So the upcoming site-specific engineering studies that we will be undertaking will actually provide more precise estimates of the measures required and associated costs. And in this regard, the Coastal and Flood Protection Fund recently set up is a, actually a strong signal that the government is serious about protecting Singaporeans from climate change. And this is something that we will, we will work through and follow up with in generations to come. Now, coming back to that part about Singapore being a regional um, uh, centre of excellence, I think um, when it comes to climate change, it is not something that, you know, we want to outcompete our neighbouring countries, yeah. But I think um, we do it as a necessity for Singapore and as a result of which we will need to build our own expertise, our knowledge base, yeah, and be better informed. 
And because we are in a tropical um, uh, uh, environment, yeah, I think the when we talk about nature-based solutions and things like this, as we explore and you know research into these areas that could uh, potentially be effective for our local context, I think it can also be extended regionally for uh, the for the region as well. So I think um, uh, as we are embarking on this, we do see that we can continue, you know, to hone our knowledge in this field and we hope that um, the rest of the countries, yeah, they will continue, they will start and they will, they will also uh, embark on this yeah, initiative and so that we can continue with our um, exchanges, exchange of knowledge to help one another to, um, uh, to, to grow in this, uh, in the knowledge field. Thank you. Um, right, we've got time for just one last question. I'm going to ask the same question to each of you as a final question. Um, for your respective cities, what do you consider the single most important aspect that's needed to address the impact of climate change and the resulting sea level rise? So, um, start with New York, Edgar. Yeah, thank you, Tim. Well, you know, again, you know, numbers, numbers speak. And uh, when we know that by the end of the century, we may have six, seven feet of sea level rise. You know, uh, around two meters. Uh, that is going to be very, very drastic. And uh, while we do plan long term, we also know that we have many miles of coastline. And I think it's yeah, much needed for this city, also other cities, to yeah, to start acknowledge the need for managed retreat. Uh, it's a difficult topic, but it's not something we should ignore because we cannot safeguard and protect. Uh, uh, every mile of coastline uh, that we have. We need to make choices um, and we have time to make those choices. I think that's the good news uh, as well. Thank you, Edgar. Uh, Rudolf for Amsterdam. Well, I think public awareness is uh, very, very important uh, because uh, I already told you we live uh, below sea level, but people are not aware of that uh, in their daily lives. and. Uh, we are fortunately that we have a, a country uh, with a long technological tradition in uh, dealing with uh, with water. So we have uh, we have the technology, we have the innovation, we have the but the public awareness is very important to keep it on the political agenda. Also, when there are no disasters. Thank you, Rudolf. Um, and finally, Hazel, just in respect to Singapore. I think because Singapore is already land constrained and if we were to walk around, you know, the coastlines of Singapore, you will see that most of the seafront areas are already occupied, you know, by parks, homes, industries and commercial buildings. I think when it comes to climate change, I must say that the single most important aspect needed would be to be adaptive. Yeah, because whatever we put in there, it will affect life. And there remains great uncertainties, you know, in sea level rise projections and what we know right now in 2020 is limited. Yet there is a need for us to act now than to wait. Yeah. So as more information and knowledge is made available, we will need to adjust our plans accordingly. We will need to make our plans to be flexible for us to change as we need. So we need to constantly examine our assumptions. We need to review our strategies, evaluate our plans and explore new methods. Basically, there's no final blueprint that we can work towards yeah, in this climate change plan. So our plans will have to be adaptive so that we can accommodate the changes as and when needed in time to come. Thank you, team. Thank you, Hazel. And thank you to each one of you. Uh, Edgar, particularly, thank you for getting up at four o'clock in the morning. It's much appreciated. And Rudolf in Amsterdam and obviously Hazel here in Singapore. I think for me, I'll just finish on saying, I think one of the things that's come out very clearly to me is that we have to get that right balance between uh, the resilience, the coastal and urban resilience and the competing design, demands that we have from uh, social, economic, uh, ecological factors. And uh, with that, I'll pass back to you, Ryan. Thank you very much. So uh, ladies and gentlemen, we have come to the end of the webinar and thank you so much for spending the last one hour with us. Uh, urban coastal resilience is a complex topic and there is so much that we can we have to cover. Unfortunately, we only have one hour. And so rest assured, this is not the, the end. We will be running future webinars on the same topic uh, in the coming months as we lead up to Singapore International Water Week next year. So I would like to, at, a, at this moment, also express our special thanks to our speakers. 
Pete and Laura, moderator Tim and panelists, Hazel, Rulof, and Edgar for taking the time to share their experiences with us. Before you go, uh, I would like you to help us complete a simple post-webinar survey via the same uh, mobile app, SparkUp. Your feedback will help us to improve our future webinars. At this point in time, I would also like to uh, share with you another webinar that is coming up tomorrow. So the webinar is now shown on the screen. It is focusing on another important issue, resource resilience and uh, circular e resource e management. Do join us if you have the time tomorrow. The webinar will start at 9.30 in the morning and you can sign up via the QR code uh, shown on the screen. So with that, we look forward to seeing you again next time. Thank you so much for spending your day with us and uh, look forward to seeing you next time.